Hello, everyone, again. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about two studies, more or less. Uh, the first one, uh, I'm happy to present this today because many of you who are involved are here. Uh, and uh, the second study is a bit more on what I started a few years ago and more or less continuing a bit today. Uh, a bit about myself. Uh, can I hide this guy? That is the chat. You have to press the chat. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's it. Okay, great. You know all the tricks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm from Canada, uh, and uh, from the East Coast, I give you a bit of geography lesson here first. Uh, I did my PhD here uh, in chemistry, and uh, just this is for reference where it is. I recommend visiting whenever you have the chance to be on the East Coast. Um, I kind of come from a different background, actually. I was studying the formation of small metal nanoclusters, uh, gold and silver. Eventually, I was looking at clusters of calcium carbonates, uh, and, and I became interested to understand how biology can essentially direct the formation of nanomaterials. And after my PhD, I thought, okay, let's do something different. Let's see what else biology can do. And this is when my laser pointer stops working. Oh, yeah, because I think yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. Just put the, the damage. Yes, again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, of course, uh, MTB was really something that blew my mind. In Germany, later continuing as uh, his lab moved to uh, south of France. And now, as Neha mentioned, now I'm starting my own uh, research line there as a CNRS researcher. And so biominerals in general, many of you are familiar. Um, I, I like to classify them in different categories. And one is macro, which we are all familiar with, teeth and bone. Their hierarchical structure is what makes them so unique and interesting. Uh, we also have minerals uh, from living systems like uh, oyster shell. And now you have a biomineral that's really in close contact with the living organism. So there's a specific function that's really necessary for the organism. And these are just examples of how biomineralities are really fascinating and how such unique structures come from them. But I, I was more interested, it's still smaller, I was interested in what I refer to as microbiominerals. This is an example of a coccolithophore microalgae with a coccolith, a calcitic plate on the surface. And even smaller, we have minerals uh, of magnetite, which I'll talk about today in magnetotype bacteria. And the reason why I found this system so particularly interesting is that it really is a very constrained model. You're looking at the mineral forming in this one specific organelle. Uh, these systems are also very interesting, but a bit more complex because they have different scales. Uh, so I will talk more or less about the MTB and the magnetosome. And my, my approach is using more X-ray based spectroscopy and microscopy methods, because I'm interested to follow how magnetite is formed in this biological system. What kind of chemical controls does the bacteria use to form this crystal? And so this is my first TM image of MTB, and I was very proud of this because as a chemist, uh, growing bacteria and only this type of bacteria, or what I saw, uh, was very uh, special for me. Um, and these guys, MTB, some, a lot of the cultured uh, species we have, they grow these nice long chains in the cell. Uh, they are mostly a magnetite, but there are some species that grow the analog uh, Grigite. And so when this is dried on a grid and they're all kind of all in different orientations, but when you have an applied magnetic field, you see they line up very well with this applied field. So when they're swimming, they're more or less following this one, uh, this one dimensional uh, line. And they use this, as I'll explain a bit more, uh, they use this essentially to find their preferred chemical environment. So it really minimizes the amount of searching they have to do. This is one aspect of perhaps why they have this, this magnetic uh, moment. And looking more at this chain, it's really quite amazing the, the structural details that the bacteria has to, to form this chain. One is that they, they have these organelles kind of ready to go. They have this kind of a lipidic uh, membrane ready for the crystal to form. And they also have these, these filaments that keep the structure of the chain uh, in contact with the bacteria. So these are some of the insights that have come to light the last 10, 20 years. And if we look more specifically at the crystal itself, uh, it's a very uh, pure crystal, pure compared to abiotic uh, and highly crystalline. And you can see around it, you have this lipidic membrane. Uh, and of course, this is 
But also another part of the uh, biomolization that's quite complex, the highly orchestrated movement of proteins assembly and transport of metal. So that's another aspect I won't talk about much today, but uh, it is another aspect that's quite amazing. So as I mentioned, the MTB used this, this magnetic moment from the chain to help them align with the magnetic field as they swim in their environment. So they, they're typically searching for environments with low oxygen. Uh, so it's really kind of a sweet spot that they're trying to find more or less. I show this image because I think it's interesting nowadays that MTB are forming more than magnetites. Uh, several groups have identified amorphous calcium carbonates uh, and also looking at uh, another kind of small iron bearing mineral or iron bearing organelle is the ferrozone, which was discovered not, not too long ago. Um, so they have actually quite an important role in transporting metals in different uh, geological systems. So um, a lot of people are finding them quite interesting to study. When they die, uh, there's another field that is also looking at the, the crystals that are buried in rock. And uh, more and more, we're looking at uh, magnetic or even chemical signatures of these magnetisms, which can relate to when the species, what species it was, perhaps, and what conditions they were living in. So this is really a, a bit of a link to the past. So MTV are quite uh, uh, kind of everywhere now in different fields. So they continue to be of interest to myself as well. So I was really only familiar with these bacteria. And then when I moved to the south of France, I met this guy who was a little, I find, it was a little crazy for me at the time. Uh, he came to me and said, telling me, well, you know, bacteria are great, but we found something even more interesting. Uh, so what they have here, I'll find my pointer. So what, what he found uh, more or less by accident, he tells me, is when he was trying to extract some, some NTB from a sediment sample, uh, he actually found at, at the other magnetic pole, which he put by accident, he saw a lot, a lot of these larger magnetic objects. And there he's switching the, the magnets in the bottom from this drop, and they're swimming back and forth to the, uh, essentially to the interface. So just to show that they really are controlled by a magnetic field. This is what they look like with an optical microscope. And so he, he approached me saying, okay, we have, we have these guys and they are apparently uh, they are in symbiosis with um, possibly magnetotactic bacteria. And so, and this is at the moment where they're really first discovering this. And uh, so they essentially are uh, what they call a holobionts, or it's essentially the symbiosis between these surface attached bacteria and a eukaryotic host. Here is a bit messy because it's dried on a CEM grid, but it really shows you that the chains are kind of somewhat aligned a little bit and really um, quite impressively there's dozens of chains that are here. When we look at the, the magnetosome, we also found magnetite and similar to what we see in culture, highly crystalline. Uh, so this was really quite an exceptional finding. Um, the first work, uh, this figure kind of explains it well. Uh, they, they spent a bit more focus on the syntrophy, the interaction possibly between the host and the surface attached bacteria. So just showing you here, and similarly uh, in, in parallel to what an MTB free swimming would do, uh, it uses these bacteria to, to find its, its specific environment. So it really benefits from having this magnetotactic ability. Um, but this study, as I was mentioning, it focused a bit more also on the chemical interactions between the host and the surface bacteria. One possible route is production of hydrogen gas, which is deposited or stored in hydrogenosomes. These are these organelles that are kind of along the outside of the host. Uh, and this perhaps helps the sulfate reducing bacteria in their formation of ATP. And so this, uh, and the other, on the other side, the MTB could also be digested. So there seemed to be an interesting symbiosis here. What, we, what they didn't go into too much detail was the magnetic properties of this guy and, and how are the chains so optimized. So this discovery opened up kind of new questions. And, and as I joined this group, we were kind of keen to, to combine different skills and experiences. Um, so one of the questions we had was, OK, are these, are these chains really optimized for the host? Or are they just kind of haphazardly uh, attached? Or is this something that we can perhaps preserve in native state and really look at the organization? Uh, second, perhaps, are these dipoles of the chains really aligned together? Are they, are they working 
Are they somehow dividing in a way that maintains the optimal uh, magnetic moment of the host? Is this something that's controlled or is it random? And this would have implications on essentially the interaction between these two, between the host and the bacteria, and leads more to the potentially the life cycle of, of the, the ectosymbiotes, which are the surface surface attached bacteria. So there's lots of different words to describe the host and the and the ectosymbiont. So I'll just say the bacteria and the host, so you understand. I'm not throwing into any other words. Uh, I want to. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I wanted to highlight some of the nice results we had in the study where we were kind of combining physical characterizations with the uh, magnetosactic polybia. Roma, who's present today, gave uh, really nice work with a uh, critical point drying preparation. Uh, really nice image to illustrate the two different flagella this guy has. Uh, and it swims in, in this direction. And I'll show you a bit later how that looks. Um, and also with the help of Kareem's team here, there's some nice SEM to look at uh, changing the, the voltage energy, you can see more about the surface structure detail, which are quite aligned from pole to pole of the certain direction. When you change the energy to a higher voltage, you get to see a bit more of the magnetisms here, the, the lighter colors it might be difficult to see. Um, but uh, so this really was nice to preserve the ultra structure of the uh, polo beyond. And next, we looked a bit more detail using thin sections to look at essentially the proximity of these MTB or the, uh, the bacteria with the host. So if we do this section in this, in this direction, uh, showing you here are the bacteria, the dark spots are the magnetosomes. And so more or less, we were confirming what we'd seen before. But interestingly, when we make a cut in another direction, we, we see something a little more detail. We actually see that the crystals, these black spots, are actually quite close to the host. Um, wasn't observed before, but more or less, a lot of the particles are kind of in the lower half, closer to the uh, surface of the host. And the second was more of the structural uh, detail, where the bacteria have this kind of wing structure, so they perhaps interlock with each other to stay around the host. Um, so after we had this, we had uh, kind of the overstructure, the flagella, we had this interesting wing structure, but the question was what, let's try and really look at the magnetism chains without this fixation or chemical uh, 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 modifications that perhaps, you know, there are effects that we could be shrinking or moving the bacteria. So let's try and preserve this as much as we can. Uh, and this is where I kind of came into the picture because uh, I was going to Alba Synchrotron in Spain to do uh, cryo uh, soft X-ray tomography. And Christopher handed me this big jar and he said, take this with you. And uh, then he explained how to how to remove the holobionts and all this business. And so after making four or five grids, none of them worked. And then one grid worked and only on one squares could I find perfectly where I, what I needed. Uh, this is how this technique works, if you've ever done it. Um, but essentially you're capturing just, a, I have a picture here. Essentially you're, you're capturing like a, a picture of your follow me onto your sample. Um, and uh, in cryo, again, you, you are doing a, a preservation that more or less keeps the native structure of the host and the bacteria. This is what we were really trying to, to get at. So how tomography works, you have uh, essentially, this is just the image of the, of the follow me onto space on, but then you do a tilt series so that you look at the different angles. Then you have a, essentially a reconstruction into 3D where you, you actually move along the Z direction. So you can kind of uh, explore the volume uh, in this direction of the object. And with the help of um, uh, programs like Amira, you can do what's called volume segmentation. And with this, then you can have uh, now assignment of the materials. And I'll show you here in this kind of cheesy movie, uh, the identification of the magnetosomes. So it's quite a large object. There are many different things, but luckily the magnetisms are quite defined uh, based on their contrast and their position. So it was easier to, to define this volume and also just to put in reference to the host cell. So what we found from this was that more or less the chains are what we had expected. Some of the chains had started to attach, which is probably due to the, the, the plunge freezing process, but this more or less confirmed the pole to pole organization of the magnetism chains. And so this confirmed the organization, but the question was still, what about the actual individual magnetic poles? And this was something that really 
was probably my favorite experiment of the study. <laughs> and uh, this was during a very interesting time, as uh, <laughs> Nicholas uh, remembered. Um, and this, this technique, it's a bit, a bit tricky to explain. I'm gonna do the best I can, but there are many details, so I will try to be as, as clear as possible. So instead of taking a, a snapshot of like your, of your object, we are now using a beam, a beam line of the synchrotron soleil uh, called a SIGSUM, scanning X-ray transmission microscopy. And this gives you a very small beam of about 20, 30, or 40 nanometers. So you kind of scan your sample and you, you collect your image in transmission. Uh, there was no X-ray fluorescence at this point. Um, and so the second part I will, I will explain on the next slide, but we also used uh, X-ray magnetic circular dichroism to essentially entangle the magnetic moment of each of the crystals or the magnetic chain. I'll explain this next. So first I will, this was an interesting time because uh, we were allowed to come to our beam time, but with many precautions and things. I'm pretty sure we were only allowed four at the beam line. So that's why Kareem was on laptop. And I apparently wasn't supposed to be in the room. So I, I guess I was in the room beside the taking photo. Anyway, um, uh, Emily is not here, but she was also very uh, helpful in this project, especially for this experiment and the data analysis. Um, and Nicola, yeah, you were, you were, this was a great moment. You were in control here. You were. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I was mentioning that it's it's a difficult experiment, but uh, it requires a lot of setup because typically with XMCD, you apply magnetic fields and you are changing the polarization of the X-rays to probe uh, the electronic structure of your magnetic material. And so we didn't want to disturb the, the poles of the magnetic moments of the chains because if we, we take our cells and then we apply a strong magnetic field, we are going to change the natural magnetic moment of the chains. So essentially to extract our samples, we used as weak magnetic fields as possible. And what we had done is uh, deposit them on TEM grids. And then we tried to find the ones that are really kind of uh, perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So that the magnetosome chains are going in this direction and you're gonna be tilting in this direction. And if you tilt your sample at 30 degrees, you have this really interesting uh, intrinsic property that you can probe. That is that when you change the polarization of the X-rays, you actually can favor the dipoles of the particles you're measuring. And so in this case, this gave us a way to, to just map uh, if we are seeing more signal from circular uh, right polarization or circular left. And you'll see how this, how this was relevant to the next map. But what we had done is essentially mapped uh, magnetite. We did the, the full spectrum. And we, we chose the, the features which gave the maximum difference between the two polarizations. So just kind of keep this, this in mind where the magnetosome chain is tilted one way and the dipoles are tilted that way. You will have more of this red signal or the polarization will be more transmitted. And then you have, uh, if the magnetosomes are going the other way, you'll have the other polarization. You'll see how this works in the next one. So as I mentioned, we deposited the cells and we had to keep in, in mind the swimming direction relative to the flagella. So I show that on here in the bottom. So we, here are two examples where the flagella is on the right side and the flagella is on the left side. So these are two different uh, samples. And so then this is the sticks of map, which you get in transmission. So you see the magnetism chains here. So we tried to choose chains that are, choose chains that are very much, uh, as I mentioned, perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So, when we do this trick where we, we look at the, the energy where we see this maximum difference between the circular polarized left and right, we can then map essentially the, the, the maps in the respective colors. So in the first you see with this scanning direction, more or less the particles have this red color. We do see interestingly these regions where we have these kind of inverse particles, which actually has been observed before in other MTB, uh, but here was, was quite uh, particular. This also helped us confirm that we are we didn't apply a magnetic field that biased all the fields in one direction. So that was nice that we were able to confirm that. When we look at the second sample, as I was as I was mentioning, with the opposite swimming directions, now we see the color it has been reversed. So that the polarization in the other direction now has a strong interaction with the the, uh, the magnetisms. So this was really uh, quite something that really proved that 
here we have evidence that the chains are organized and somewhat maintained to have a really optimum uh, magnetic moment that's given to the whole object. Uh, Nicola had uh, further gone a bit further to, to further look at this, confirming that what we have is more or less the alignment of the easy axis for magnetite. And so this was a bit going even further to, to confirm this. And uh, we had also investigated this region, but it was a bit difficult to get any, uh, any uh, confident results of that. And so um, the last part was, okay, now we have the structurally, and now we have the alignment of the magnetic moments. Now let's measure the magnetic moment of this object and try to make sense of what we've measured. So this is a U-turn uh, experiment. Here, essentially, we let the, the hollow bayon swim in an applied magnetic field. And then we, we turn the, the magnetic field, so in the opposite direction, quite suddenly. And what we do is we measure either the, the distance, like the, the radius of the turn, but we also can measure what we did here is the actual time it takes to completely reverse direction. So you see here uh, the derivative in the y direction of where the field is reversed. We're able to collect uh, this called turning time. And with this, uh, this equation here, we're able to then calculate essentially the magnetic moment from the number of turning times that we've measured. So from this, we measured 22 holobionts doing this, this uh, turn, and we solved for the magnetic moment. And what we got was a value compared to the single MTB free swimming. We have a value that's about a thousand times uh, greater. Um, considering that we have almost uh, on average about a hundred of these chains, uh, this is really a highly optimized uh, magnetic object. We were quite surprised by this. Um, we further did some mic micromagnetic calculations to compare essentially a single chain and the magnetotaxis or the magnetotactic advantage that is needed to overcome Brownian motion in these kind of environments. And what we found that uh, from this calculation, we really only need a few chains to overcome uh, this kind of magnetotactic advantage in relatively weak fields. So as you have stronger fields like today, or 30 or 40 micro Tesla, really the number of chains we have here is, is in excess. So this result was, was quite interesting to to come to because this puts the role of the magnetosome in a bigger context. Um, beyond what was found in the first study, we seem to show that the chains, they're, how they're organized, uh, has essentially given a lot of benefits to hosts. The one question is why is it so magnetic if it doesn't need to be? So the production of magnetosomes could help for uh, energy benefit or perhaps uh, detoxification to the host. Uh, perhaps also the Accumulation of iron is difficult for the host, and having these surface bacteria taking in and making as many magnetosomes could also offer a benefit. Um, it was a really interesting study. I think that opened up more questions than solved any. Uh, if you do want to look more details, I show the paper here, um, and obviously I'm happy to discuss after. So I will take a, just a quick water break. But I'm happy to see many of you here. <laughs> um, so, so I want to go back just to the magnetosome uh, organelle itself. Uh, so, forget about the holobionts for now. <laughs> Maybe we can talk more after. Uh, but this is what originally inspired me to, to come this way and to, to study MTB was to learn how do MTB make magnetite. And why we are interested in mag magnetite formation is beyond the chemistry, we're also looking to apply magnetosomes to a number of biological applications. Shown here are just some examples of how we functionalize MT uh, magnetosomes for different applications. We're even trying closer to what I'm interested in is to even synthesize uh, essentially bio-inspired magnetite. So creating these lipid, lipidic environments that somewhat simulate a vesicle that we can form magnetite in. So there are many different angles that we can be inspired from magnetite uh, formation by MTB. And as I mentioned in the beginning with the magnetosome membrane, it's quite a, a complex structure and a lot of people are taking very specific uh, aspects of this and studying the function of one single protein. So there are tens of proteins that are working together that is quite difficult to entangle, but more and more we're uncovering the potential role of each of these proteins that seem to be involved. 
Um, I want to contrast this with forming magnetite at ambient conditions, where really you, you can form magnetite really roughly by essentially putting them together at the right uh, combination of iron two and iron three, uh, obviously under more or less anoxic conditions. But just to show that when you compare MTB at, uh, at room temperature versus magnetite formation at room temperature, you really have a totally different control over the formation of the particle. Uh, obviously, this is without any sort of kind of protecting ligands to, to passivate the surface of the particles. But one example that I like to show is that the, the magnetism membrane really confines the, the growth of the particle. So you really are able to, to limit the size. And for a lot of MTB, the particles are in the single magnetic uh, domain. So they're quite useful for a number of applications. Contrasting that with uh, abiotic, which of course doesn't have uh, uh, organic solvent or, or protecting ligands to, to kind of, uh, confine the size, you have more of a kind of a bigger spread that's a bit more difficult to control. So this is one example of, of why MTB are quite, uh, quite impressive in this way. Um, and so this was where I kind of came in with the question, how does, how does magnetite form from iron, from the, from the nutrient media? Is there a specific uh, pathway or is there a specific iron intermediate that's necessary uh, for the formation of magnetites? Does it just form magnetite directly? These were questions that a lot of uh, researchers were already trying to, trying to ask and trying to characterize. And they've taken somewhat two different approaches. One approach the researchers use are uh, to collect a, a large amount of MTB and to essentially make a pellet that they will use for a bulk measurement, uh, whether that be magnetic measurement or spectroscopy, or they deposit the cells on, on grids or substrates and they're doing more microscopy-based methods. And so this was the question about uh, what we are measuring here uh, versus here, is that the response we get from whether magnetic measurement or spectroscopy, is it representative of uh, the whole population or is it a mixture of, of different uh, components that are giving you this response? This is one of the, the topics that's also always coming up when we discuss these two approaches from the bulk versus single cell. And I will just briefly show one example of, uh, this was one of, the, one of the main studies done on magnetite formation of MTB, where they were trying to follow the formation from the iron precursor intermediates to the final magnetite mineral. And so how this works, this uh, technique is you're absorbing x-rays in the core level. They are excited to valence state and then to uh, eventually eject it. So you have a combination of electronic information when that transition happens. And then you also have uh, more structural information on how these x-rays are emitted and scattered and uh, essentially completing the absorption event. And both of them together give a lot of information about the electronic structure and the local environment of iron. And for example, in this study, when they're looking at pellets of MTB at different stages of formation, they were seeing that there seems to be a, a very high grade intermediate that was rich in phosphate. And this is uh, another group had also confirmed this. Um, however, if you look at the microscopy perspective, uh, even looking at one single bacterium, this is with the Stixum technique, uh, similar to what I showed you before. Even just in a single bacterium, you actually have uh, a range of different iron products in one cell. So it, it begs the question, uh, do we have uh, essentially one product here that's forming synchronously, or is it really a mixture of uh, iron species that we're measuring all together? And this is where I try to um, think about this question and use a new tool. Uh, a tool that new in the way that it hasn't been used to study MTB uh, for magnetite formation. This is a similar being to Stixum, but it's much longer in, in length, giving you higher energy x-rays. Uh, with not as, uh, the resolution is a bit less, about 50 nanometers. But what I want to highlight is that it gives a bit more information on the uh, electronic structure by doing zanes. Uh, and also you can collect uh, scattering as well if you're interested in. So this is showing you essentially how you can measure it with different uh, detectors and complementary information. One is XRF. Um, XRF is, a bit, is probably more well known. Um, where you can collect essentially the X-ray fluorescence of your sample as long as the energy is high enough to excite the elements that have uh, emissions below. So you can actually use XRF to do uh, XAS. And there's other kind of uh, scattering or transmission techniques that you can also apply. 
And this is a, a spectral microscopy approach. So what you can do is you can map a, a region of interest in X and Y, for example, and then you, you keep mapping this region over the absorption edge you're interested. In. So if you want to do iron, we will start mapping either before or after the edge, and we will successively take the same region of interest. And so after that, you have a 3D data set where you can essentially look at each pixel and extract a spectrum, or you can do a more uh, statistical analysis to try and define uh, unique regions in your data set. And so I first use this to image MTB to show essentially what, what kind of signal we can get from just MTB. Uh, first grown under high iron condition where you have a nice uh, magnetism chain. So you see the corresponding iron fluorescence here. Uh, you'll notice that there's some other material, titanium. This is actually added specifically to do the hyperspectral imaging because as you change energy, you slightly move. The titanium particles I deposited help give you a reference point so you can you can uh, keep the maps uh, overlapped. And what's quite nice actually, even at this high energy, uh, this is even I think it's eight keV, you actually have contrast to the bacterial membrane as well. So you can combine the uh, this is differential phase contrast with the X-ray fluorescence. So you can actually have a nice image of your bacteria with hard X-ray energies. Showing you in the second example is what I kind of wanted to test was what can what kind of information from iron can we get? The second species here is uh, MSR1 as well, which is the uh, species that I'm mainly working with. But this was grown with no extra iron. So uh, this is grown with 50 micromolar iron citrate. This is with zero added iron. The iron that's used to form magnetosomes is likely from uh, yeast and other, um, other products that are used. There's always a little bit of iron and, and peptone as well. So there's enough iron to actually make a small magnetosome chain like this. And still, we can still detect it with uh, this technique. So uh, as I mentioned, each pixel of this map gives you information. This XRB, uh, XRF map, essentially here, you, you have the spectrum that's collected. So obviously, I'm just mapping this, uh, this peak, which is the, main, uh, the strongest iron emission. And then you see, this is where I was uh, putting the X-ray energy. So as we change the energy, we can collect uh, full spectrum, so we can actually we want to just highlight the whole magnetism chain. We can collect a full uh, iron XAS uh, experiment like this as well. And to go a bit further, we can then apply some statistical tools, which really helps uh, to separate the differences in the iron signal. So what I showed you here are the two same samples as before. This is the cell grown with the high iron. This is grown with low iron. So the main finding we found here was that, well, we found that the magnetite had oxidized. That was uh, expected because this is measured at ambient uh, conditions. There were no precautions taken. But what was really interesting was we were trying to elucidate the iron that's affiliated uh, around the chain and in the cell. And what we had found is that um, uh, about 22% of other iron species that were found were outside of the magnetism chain region. And when we decrease the amount of iron, we, we still see there's there's a bit less, but still kind of similar. Um, we can go even further to try and uh, define what each of these uh, regions uh, contain. So the first is the magnetism chain, and you see how this is the oxidized magnetite. But you can it gets a bit difficult because as you get further away, you have less and less iron, so it's more difficult to have confidence of your fitting. But this can start to give you an idea of what uh, oxidation state or even the phase that they're in. We tried one more thing. Uh, so we identified that there is still some iron left in the cell. Um, but let's, let's see if we can play with it a bit to see if there's more of this uh, intracellular iron that's not associated with magnetosomes in different conditions. So the one thing we did test was uh, we took the same MSR1. We deprived it of iron, which is kind of a classic uh, bioionization test. We add the iron uh, back to 50 micromolar. And what we found here was that about 50% of the other iron species, so these are just the magnetisms shown in the arrows, but there's other iron that also uh, essentially dried or in, in the cell uh, during this moment. So now we were able to kind of say, okay, now we can actually discern the magnetisome chain from the intracellular iron species. And the next question was, is this perhaps ferritin or some other uh, iron storage protein. And 
we went a bit further to show this by using a mutant, which essentially was uh, unable to produce ferritin. So we kind of, we replicated this experiment without ferritin being present. So we tried to show this that now when we add the iron, we mainly only have the iron signal from magnetite. There is still a little bit that's left though. So this, we were able to show the, the difference of magnetite and the intracellular iron. But uh, of course, I think there needs to be more controls. And so this, this study showed that the possibilities of what we can do with this technique, but I would say that in the future, we need to make more and more controls uh, and also more precautions. So this was done at ambient conditions. Next I'd like to do is essentially to have a more expanded data set, but to do this under cryo conditions. So similarly to plunge freezer samples at uh, certain conditions, and then be able to do this kind of experiment. Uh, it's a bit more difficult because this technique, high energy, nano pro, cryo, it, it's very difficult to get beam time here. So uh, it's something I am planning. Uh, if you want more information, uh, I didn't have a lot of time to go over the whole thing, but uh, please uh, feel free and ask me after. Um, so I think I will just sum up very quickly what I've done. Uh, I, I know that uh, it, it's, it's almost lunchtime. So. <laughs> Um, the one thing I will I will leave you with is um, these days I am working more with um, trying to measure uh, MTB and other biomineralizing microorganisms while they are still living, and this is a bit of a, a challenging. It's more of a challenging experiment, uh, more technical than, than the scientific question. Um, but when I first saw MTB, I was first exposed to the temperature. <laughs> where they were trying to put MTB in a TEM cell and trying to get contrast in the mechanism chain. Um, I, I saw the, the, the interest in trying to do this to try and capture a biomineralization with living cells, but I'm really X-ray biased. So I was always thinking, how can I do this with the synchrotron? Um, and uh, what I was able to do in the last couple of years was I was able to try two approaches. One is with soft X-ray energies, so using the, the stixum technique that I was showing you, and the other one is using this hard X-ray nanoprobe, so the last technique I showed you. Now, the benefit here is that um, with X-rays, you have essentially a weaker interaction with the water and with the biological material that offers you a bit more penetration. So it offers a, a better contrast of your sample. It's, with TM, it's possible, but it's very, it's quite difficult. You have to have a very uh, well prepared sample, and uh, you're able to also have a more versatile stage because you can kind of play around, uh, not at uh, under vacuum conditions. What I did find though was that at higher energy, we have a much larger penetration depth uh, compared to soft X-ray. Here, I show you uh, the attenuation length of the X-rays at uh, 700 dB is about a micron, so that means that close to half of the X-ray energy is gonna be absorbed in one micron of water. When the cells are about half a micron, you're really squeezing your cell into a very small space. When you work with higher energy X-rays, you're able to essentially have more space to work with. The penetration depth is over a thousand microns here. So now you don't have to worry so much about your sample environment or having these very kind of uh, uh, silicon nitride sandwiches. So this is something that I am, uh, Working on with MTB, uh, it was able to use a kind of a custom device with silicon nitride and PEMS, and um, this works quite well. Uh, when you just put it in the beam line, it's quite stable. If you if you measure at one of the channels, showing you here is just the contrast between the PEMS channel and uh, this is just seawater. So just to show you that it's quite stable in the mapping. And the idea is essentially to, to get the bacteria into the, this kind of liquid layer and, and measure them as they're forming magnetites to get some information on how fast they're forming. And also if we can measure the intracellular iron that's also present. This is a bit more challenging, but it's something that uh, I've been trying to work towards. Um, what we see is that when you compare uh, dried cells, so grown under different iron conditions, we're able to, to see some iron signal uh, when you first load the bacteria in. For zero iron, we don't have a strong enough signal, especially when it's in liquid. It's difficult to get a, a peak that we can assign to magnetosomes. Um, but if we found that, if we, if we put the cells in and they, this, the flow is stabilized, 
we actually can measure over 150 cells in 10 minutes. So this gives you an idea of the possibility of getting enough statistics to follow the formation over time, rather than just a single cell, single cell. Um, and I've tried this uh, kind of uh, bioionization test where we essentially have the cells in all iron. We add the iron and we, we do different maps over the course of uh, several hours. We have found that they do start to take up iron and form magne uh, magnetisomes, but they don't seem to change after two or three hours. And so one reason is perhaps the, the environment of the bacteria in are being exposed to a lot of X-ray radiation. So one option is to, to flow in new cells and measure them. The other is actually to change the, the format of this device, because I showed you this device that has it's kind of, a, it's a bit more bulky. And so this, what I'm trying to use here is actually a transmission. So here we actually have just two silicon nitride membranes. So this is what I was trying to get away from, but now I'm back to this. But in this sandwich, uh, you actually are able to measure even Zanes now. Before I could not even measure the same map because uh, once you measure it, the cells seem to move or go elsewhere. But now, um, with this approach, we're getting closer to measuring, well, we can measure hydrated bacteria versus dry. Um, but now we're going to try and do something similar because we think that perhaps it limits the dose that the, the bacteria are experiencing. So this is a quite technically challenging, but there's something interesting to, to continue here. So I think uh, it was over a bit 40 minutes, but uh, I'm, you guys are all still here, so it's great. Um, so uh, I kind of wanted to give you an overview of what I've been doing with NTD, uh, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I have to thank uh, a lot of the people who were involved in this work in orange here, and uh, and from the combination of these two studies, there's a lot of people to thank. Um, so we're the micro uh, microbiology uh, team at the uh, at the BM. Uh, we're a small team doing many different things, but it's quite a nice environment, and we'd be happy to host you if you ever come. Uh, so thanks very much. All right. So time for some questions uh, for people on the chat. Feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself for questions uh, and people here. Feel free to raise questions. Kelly. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, welcome. What, what type of um, choices should it? And what is the uh, slide information? Is it mm. the other condition that doesn't make it easier to capture it? Mm. Uh, does it make it easier to culture it? You can capture it, uh. um, not in the Ah, uh, okay. Um, Roma can correct me, but I think it's Euglenozoa, the protus of this one. Uh, and so the, typically they're extracted from sediments, so they're in anoxic conditions. Um, I believe that the team of Christopher, they are trying to find the conditions to, to cultivate these guys. Um, I don't know if there's been any success. I don't think so, no. <laughs> I think it's a very specific niche that they're occupying. Uh, so, and typically they're they're actually found in many different places, but this was from a, a sea, uh, from sea sand, like from sand, essentially. Uh, but the hollow beyond seem to exist in many different environments, like lakes and streams as well. Uh, so, so far there's no success in, in culturing them, but let's see. But I think more or less it's anoxic for all of them, I think. So, so that makes it also difficult in the, in the lab to maintain this uh, environment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. The, in the Arctic Arden spray study, mm -hmm. the, you mentioned the magnetites were oxidized. Yes. Uh, which is not so obvious. At, at, at what moment do you see they are oxidized? Because usually uh, when they are when they stay in cells, mm -hmm. you don't extract them. Yes. Uh, Fourteen hundred years uh, magnetite was in cells, so and yeah. they are usually not oxidized. So it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting mm -hmm. point. Yeah. It's something I would want to, because uh, the one limitation, as I mentioned, is that it isn't under ambient conditions. And I didn't take any precautions to preserve the dried cells. But yeah, usually it's usually just some surface oxidation if it's just a few days, right? So uh, um, we we don't think it's beam induced because we measured the same cell twice and we had the same signal. 
so it could have just been that perhaps we had smaller particles that oxidized more quickly than the, the, the full ones. That may have been the reason. Mm -hmm. But would you have expected less, like 10 or 20% yeah, oxidation? The yeah. 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 One, one thing that, because it's quite an intensive measurement where you have to math and you map the same region mm -hmm. over and over again, one possibility could be that you are burn, you're burning off the carbon. So you're kind of exposing the magnetite over mm -hmm. the course of the measurement. That could be one reason why, in the end, we have maybe something that's a bit more oxidized. And, and then the, just to, to be correct, with the iron, which was not in magnetite, mm -hmm. or in previous magnetite, yeah. it, it was iron surface. Yeah, it was iron, oxidized iron. Yeah. We didn't, uh, I showed the linear combination fitting, and it, it gives all iron three uh, components. But I, I can't comment on, you know, it's, it's a dried cell, so I'm not sure if the, the original form could have changed into something more stable, hematite. Or, yeah, so. Yeah, that, uh, so thanks a lot for, for the talk. It's exciting to see. Thanks. Yeah, so I think we, we also see similar things with calcium with the, the iron cells. Yeah. Uh, and I'm wondering, have you had any clue about whether that, that iron might be the crossover or mm. the on, surface? Uh, on the surface of the cell? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, from, from this measurement, I mean, uh, I'm somewhat convinced that during the drying process, we think that a lot of the iron kind of condenses around the magnetism chain, this kind of structure that's in the cell. And that's what we seem to observe from this kind of radial pattern, as we as you should see in this FTP uh, here. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't be sure uh, if there are some small clusters of iron that are decorating the surface. Uh, with, um, so actually we tried to do um, stick some in liquid of MTV. And uh, when we measured at uh, 500 dB, so before oxygen absorbs, we have a nice cell. Uh, we didn't see any small particles, but this is stick some. So the rest of these particles could be nanoscopic, like uh, just a few nanometers maybe. So we tried to do iron. So we tried to go from 500 to 710. And the thickness of the water was too much. So we couldn't see it in native state, but this is something that I think for calcium carbonates could be interesting because you are not limited uh, for calcium edge uh, and liquid as sticks in. Well, you are, but not as much as I am. So, so yeah, it'd be interesting if you have uh, some. That's just something for cyanos that seems to be a concentrating mechanism that. Uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, yes, Nick, <laughs> go for it. Okay, uh, so I have a question because I have observed so many uh, magnetic, magnetic bacteria, and depending on the natural samples, mm. I always observe uh, magnetism with magnetite. And on time course experiment, yeah. I observe very different things. Yes, that's right. So I, I'm wondering if the time course procedure mm -hmm. does not induce by itself. A different yeah. way of different pathway of yes yeah I think this is one of the questions that is uh, the one issue is that you start with iron you start with the cells that have been deprived of iron for several passages so once you give them iron yeah they they, they start to put it different ways they maybe make stuff by accident who knows that so I I think that that's one issue of the um, of using this kind of uh, approach. Uh, but this was one reason why I was working with this mutant where it didn't have any ferritin. And actually, it's a chemically induced uh, uh, magnetite formation. So when you add a, a specific chemical, it triggers the formation of the uh, man B protein, which is important for the vesicle. So this it was a way to kind of get over this iron stress that you heard. And what we saw was less iron in the cell. We saw less of this intracellular iron. So there could be a way, uh, but then it begs the question with other studies, they saw this ferrihydrate uh, phosphate enriched, which is probably bacterial ferritin, probably. Yeah. So then it's, the question is the bacteria probably has different ways to make magnetite and depending on the conditions it may choose, like this is the better one, this is the better one, uh, combining them. So, so the, I wish I had done more with the mutants and the wild type to do this comparison, because I think that there's something interesting to, 
bring to light what you mentioned. It's unnatural for them to form from zero micromolar to 50 like this. So. But uh, yeah, so I agree, it's not natural. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, maybe about uh, <laughs> okay. genetic limitation. So how, yeah. how, how much are we limited? Right now, so basically, there mm. we need to strengths, right? Uh, genetically modified strains, AB1, MSR1, uh, good question. I know someone else might know more about this in the audience, but, uh, uh, so that's to, to see the diversity. Um, I, I know for MSR1, there are many mutants that are really kind of activating, deactivating different processes, like the Schuller group have, I'm sure, a whole freezer of, uh, of mutants, right? Uh, so, and I think they're also interested in this and exploring biomolization with different uh, knockouts. And they've been doing this for a while, but they don't often follow chemically. They look at the morphology, they look at the resulting crystal, uh, perhaps magnetic measurement, but they, they don't really follow the formation of the crystal without certain proteins. So, but I think we have, I mean, I, th I think there are two strains, the ones I mentioned, perhaps there are one or two others that are have been modified now, but. I don't know, like NV1 or yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I think uh, I just used one of them, you know, so maybe mm -hmm. uh could do, open up so many different projects on different mutants. So. Um, I just have a question. You don't have the budget. There is so much more magnetism we see in the news. Do you know if they generate in general more magnetisms than bacteria? Oh, for okay, for this uh, specific bacteria that's attached to the surface. Um, I mean, in the yeah. sediments, yeah. where we would find both the bacteria ah. and the other way. Right, yeah. Which one is controlling the, 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 the amount, the global amount of magnetisms generated? Do we know I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, so it would be interesting in this particular ecological niche to see the, the which, cons controls. which yeah yeah I mean uh, in these in these aliquots there is all also MTB so but I don't know if we've really looked at the I don't know if we've compared really the quantity of each but it's, it's huge yeah so I mean if you think of just the numbers if you think of just the so I'm th I was thinking more of the the on average to how many, you know, how much magnetite per cell, or how that was different. But yeah, in this each ecological niche, there is a lot of uh, like a magnetococcus, these uh, small uh, bacteria. So I think, uh, yeah, difficult to know if, if there's a relationship or if one is, uh, so if one is maybe competing with the other, if you're interested in. But more in terms of really balanced, like mm -hmm. we go on a paleo, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, based on what I've seen as well, when I do the extraction, there are so many other bacteria that I think it would be difficult to discern the, the population. And because these magnetisms look also so similar to other, other uh, free, free swimming MTB. So for the moment, it is difficult, but there are other morphotypes, other types of holobionts detected that we've, uh, that the team of Christopher and Roma have discovered. So perhaps there could be other ones that are a bit different from what we've seen from free living bacteria. But, but yeah, this team, uh, they definitely will know more. Christopher's team in, uh, in BM. Yeah. Uh, Nick, you had a question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyone else? Oh, fabulous. I was just wondering what you can see as, as a infrastructure between what seems to be, to belong to the bacteria and what's it's more linked to exactly what we mm. see mm. and uh, how it looks like in terms of membrane. But is it something special? How? So there's yeah in um in the first paper and in this last one, uh, let me go to so 
there, there are some interesting, yeah, there are some interesting features that were found. Um, I mentioned this wing structure of the bacteria. There, there also seems to be identified these small vesicles between the bacteria, which we could, which could be perhaps communication between the bacteria. This was something that was found actually for, um, uh, let's say, a multicellular and MMP. It's a, it's a larger magnetotactic um, tactic for carrier organism. Uh, and uh, the other thing to notice that we found this kind of indentation uh, on the on the surface of the host that it was kind of like a, a scoop. So the bacteria seems to fit very well. So it, I think that it really increases the surface area between. Yeah, I think so. I think it's optimized one for structural to keep them there, and the second it's optimized for surface area contact between the host and the bacteria. So. I think, and then this is kind of the third thing. Perhaps this could be communication between the bacteria and then communication between the host and the. But we are not sure about this. I think we were a bit hesitant because sometimes there are artifacts from fixation that could cause this. So. But, but we see this, we see this often here and not here or here or so. We're not sure. But, but inter ultra structurally, there are some interesting. It seems to be only lipids or organics which have uh, nothing special or... Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Uh, no, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, among the different organisms you, you have found, you and uh, uh, more, 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 more. I'm just on the low low scale between the size and number of bacteria because I, I have took a picture and so remember the big one with thousands of yeah, yeah. bacteria. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I was wondering if there is a link between the size of the protist mm -hmm. and the number of uh... that's difficult because from this study we also show that we don't need so many chains to have a yeah. magnetotactic advantage. This is why. So that begs the question. Uh, that begs the question of, uh, yeah, there must be some other chemical benefit uh, mm -hmm. for production of magnetosomes, whether it's detoxification or energy. Uh, but I think there are some smaller protists with fewer magnetosomes per cell. Like there is one morphotype that has, I think, only four, or six, or eight. So uh, eight uh, bacteria yeah. per protist. So. But those ones also have more magnetite per cell. But I think this this kind of consortium exists on the small a smaller scale somewhat. Uh, but it's it's complex because the they're not all also surface attached. Sometimes sometimes they're inside the host or sometimes they're semi attached. Mm. But regarding right. one of your first slides in this question, mm -hmm. the, you showed the role of uh, sulfate for terminating. Mm. Mm -hmm. The metabolic yeah. process. In, in principle, uh, at least thermodynamically, it could be done by a uh, three plus. In that case, you could, you, you would make a, even expressible or magnetite. Mm. Oh, from yeah, from this from the chemical interactions that are happening. Yeah. This, uh, so one, one thing one to wonder is uh, whether this profit to explain the scale of iron mm. reduction. Yeah, yeah. But that's, yeah, uh, maybe it's more for honor, but then is there a possibility to to drive them from sulfate, for instance, or to food sulfate from the system? I think these guys, you've tried to play a bit with what you've collected, right? Or you sometimes play with keeping the bottle open or some gas exchange, you sometimes try that, but I think it's hard to really play with these parameters, yes. Hey, well, I'm not going to keep you all from lunch. So thank you, everyone, for uh, being an active uh, audience and also on Zoom. And uh, thanks, Dan, for an amazing talk. Thanks for having uh, me. So thank you.